Okay, hello. Uh, this is our uh, second panel. The moderator of this panel is uh, Mr. Kamil Mikulski from the Kościuszko Institute. So please take the floor. Uh, dear guests, dear audience, whom I do not see in, at present, but I do know that you're out there. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Jan has said, my name is Kamil Mikulski and I'm a disinformation researcher and a project manager at the Kościuszko Institute. Uh, which co-organizes this, this conference. Uh, we're a non-governmental think tank and a research institute leading the public discussion uh, in a cybersecurity related matters. And we also organize the CyberSec Fora. I have a great pleasure to moderate uh, this panel, which is titled Credibility on the Web, Checking, uh, Inculcating, and Self-Organizing Trusted Sources of Information. Uh, but uh, first, please let me introduce the, the distinguished panel. Uh, we have a special guest from Lithuania, Viktoras Daukras, uh, who is an innovator, developer, and new technologies enthusiast. He is also, what's most important, uh, the head of DeBank EU, uh, an initiative which uh, works I had a pleasure to, to come across. Uh, DeBank EU is a prominent uh, technological analytical center and also an NGO like the Kościuszko Institute, uh, whose main task is to research disinformation in the public space and uh, execute uh, national and educational media literacy campaigns. It uh, researches uh, the Baltic states and recently also Poland. Uh, so hello, Viktoras, and my second uh, guest is Professor uh, Adam Wierzbicki, who's a professor at the Polish Japanese Academy for Information Technology and the pioneer of research on web uh, content credibility. He's also an expert on big data, uh, web and data mining, and uh, machine learning, or more general in data science. Hi. Uh, this title. Uh, the checking in inculcating and sort of organizing trusted sources of information. Uh, it, it's very interesting when you think of this issue of credibility. Uh, we are coming across many different websites uh, uh, in the web uh, who may or may not be credible. And it's not always very clear. Actually, in many cases, it is somewhere in the, in the gray area and it's very hard to, to decide whether you can trust that source or whether it's, it's biased or it's, it's, it's just not okay. And with that, I would like to start the discussion uh, by asking uh, my first question to, to the professor about truth and credibility. Sometimes we think that those uh, elements and those notions are interchangeable, that truth, truth is credibility and the other way around. But uh, I know for a fact that they are not. I would like to ask you how to tell them apart. And when you, when you are in, out there in the cyberspace, which one is the most important? Uh, all right, thank you. Thank you for this question. Uh, well, uh, I'd like to uh, show you a few slides very briefly. And uh, um, oh, if I can, because right now I don't have the ability to share the screen, but uh, okay, let me start with the definition of credibility because that is probably what uh, uh, can start this discussion going. Uh, basically, uh, credibility is a property of information uh, that we receive uh, and uh, it is a property of information that makes us believe that this information is true. Uh, so you can think of it as a credibility evaluation is something that we're doing all the time. Actually, whenever we communicate, uh, we're doing this. And it is probably a part of our evolutionary background as human beings. Uh, on the other hand, truth, uh, well, uh, it is a completely different concept. It is actually independent of credibility. You can think of information which is true, but unfortunately is not credible. On the other hand, you can think of information which is not true, uh, but is credible, and this, this is the case of all successful fraud. So you, you can easily imagine examples of, of this kind, unfortunately. Uh, well, uh, you could treat truth as um, ideal, uh, or maybe as something which is unattainable, that depends on your epistemological um, opinion in reality. 
On the other hand, credibility is much more practical uh, because this is something we are doing all the time. We are evaluating credibility all the time. Uh, you can think of credibility as a complex uh, signal, which depends on, unfortunately, many things. What you said about the web pages, uh, credibility being ambiguous often, that's because web pages are complex uh, pieces of information with a lot of different things. For one instance, this is actually a division of uh, credibility into different concepts that has been done by a very famous uh, psychologist and media scientist, Karl Hovland, even into, I think, in the 1950s, quite a long time ago. Uh, so uh, he divided credibility into source credibility, message credibility, media credibility, uh, like you see here on the picture. And all of these can impact our credibility evaluations. When we receive some information or when we look at a web page, unfortunately, our credibility evaluation can be affected by a lot of different things as well, like by our knowledge, which is a very important factor. Or, uh, unfortunately, also by our social environment, for example, by peer pressure, right? You can think of that definitely peer pressure being a factor which impacts uh, credibility. Sorry, I ran ahead with a couple of slides. Take a look at this picture. Um, you can use credibility to define the things we're talking about, fake news or disinformation. For example, uh, in this picture, we see a situation where we have a source. The source has a negative evaluation of its own message. So it doesn't believe its own message, but it depends for the receiver to believe this message, to find uh, that the, the, the uh, credibility evaluation of this message is positive. And this is the case of all disinformation and fake news out there, right? Uh, it can, you, can, you can see that the, this can be defined. I'm using here the terminology from uh, the European study uh, that you're probably familiar with. Let's look at this case. It's a little bit different. Now, the original source's credibility evaluation is positive and it intends the credibility evaluation of the receiver to be positive. Isn't that a perfect case where we actually don't need to do anything? Unfortunately not. So you can see that uh, we are still investigating different kinds of information like uh, for example, the case of just forwarding fake news, fake news. This isn't the original source, really. This should be a forwarding source in this case. But if this is the original source, then this could be uh, misinformation, information which is wrong by mistake, or malinformation uh, as well. Now, what do you think about this? Like, isn't credibility uh, mm, still useful to evaluate how the source is making a credibility evaluation? And you think about it in this term. Maybe the source is not sufficiently critical. Maybe the source is uh, using reasoning that is based on a cognitive distortion. For example, I will give you an example. Let's say that we have a message, uh, all immigrants are a threat to our society. Okay, so now the original source of this message might actually find it credible, might believe it. And if it does, it tells us something about the source. This source is using a generalized reasoning, which is a cognitive distortion, okay? So uh, perhaps what we should think about when we think about credibility and truth on the web, we should think about norms, uh, about norms on evaluating credibility, okay? Because uh, psychology and media science has found a lot of things uh, about how we sh should evaluate credibility, basically, okay? What is the right way of evaluating credibility? What is the wrong way, right? Based on that, we can propose such norms and teaching such norms would be a very good way to help uh, internet users to make sense of credibility online. So that's pretty much uh, what I wanted to say using these slides, but perhaps I can also just answer some of your questions. This is extremely interesting. Uh, when I think of the, the credibility that you just uh, have shown that, us, uh, it is very much focused on how a uh, usual netizen would like to approach this, this, this issue, meaning he is searching the, the internet, he is discovering uh, certain websites he, he serves, but uh, this is a kind of approach that tells you which of the sources you're currently reading is credible or not. And uh, I would like to a little bit reverse this, this uh, approach and ask my second question to Victoras. When you are uh, down there in the cyberspace and you're not thinking whether this, uh, this piece of information is credible or not, or, or the source is credible or not, 
uh, but you're on the other side and you want to uh, look out for uh, malign actors and look for the bad guys, essentially saying. Uh, what is the difference in your thinking and what do you actually do to, to get them? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, sure. Uh, it's a very good question. So for that, I will show some slides to, to give a better understanding of what we do and what approach we take for that. Just shortly, so uh, now currently we're working in six countries, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, uh, Poland, uh, North Macedonia and United States. Uh, and uh, every month we analyze, uh, we receive about 1 million content pieces and we analyze uh, manually eight to 10,000 content pieces each month. Uh, we produce quite a lot of reports uh, from that, that I will share some processes, how things work. So this is the main process, how information is analyzed. Uh, currently, we're analyzing in 26 languages, about 1 million content pieces per month. So we use AI, our technology, to do some process of automation. So AI cannot do everything. It's more as a feature of automation of some process. It's not a general AI. Uh, but it can help us to uh, create scoring mechanisms, uh, do the topic recognition, and putting information in different uh, different shelves. So it would be easier for an analysis. Uh, this information comes in all kinds of shapes, uh, but we quite know well uh, what are the main narratives, uh, long-term narratives, also uh, the topic narratives that change over time, but we quite know them well, and it helps us a lot easier to find this information. Also, we use... Uh, Citizens in, in Baltics, they are called Lithuanian elves or just elves. So they are active citizens that support us and help to analyze information that is received and also they cooperate with analysts. Then we have this labeling process where the analysis is done, each content piece is reviewed manually and then the reports are prepared, uh, articles are prepared and they being published to stakeholders and also to general media to inform citizens of what what's actually happening there. Uh, when we speak about uh, different domains, and um, uh, so now we use just two types of information. It, either it's disinformation and misinformation or misinformation. Uh, typically, the main difference is the intent or how often uh, that author or domain or organizations tend to spread this information. Uh, what I could suggest uh, for every uh, citizen person uh, is to acquire and use more of a critical thinking, to understand what's happening there. And it's actually quite easy. It's not something that is very complicated. Uh, so you, you need to always ask yourself, uh, first thing, uh, who is the source? Uh, who is the author? Uh, just click on him or her, check what he's writing about, uh, what other issues uh, is the author in the article? There are a lot of articles that have no author and that already suggests that uh, there might be some credibility questions. Uh, is the source known? Uh, wh whom that source belongs, how it's financed? So some of these questions can be very easily Googled. If you just spot something in social media, a very popular link, uh, just Google it. And maybe you'll find the Wikipedia page. Maybe you'll find some about page or other information. So anytime you feel something is quite uh, emotional or impactful, uh, the first step would be just, you know, think. And the second step is just to do a little bit of Googling. Maybe there is already uh, another think tank who already debunked that, or maybe there is a fact checker who already fact checked that. And you can easily find and verify if that is true or not. Uh, then the other thing is how, how the content is presented, what type of photos, uh, what kind of quotes, interviews, and is there any suspicion with that? Is the headline shocking or emotional? Uh, so 95% of this information comes in negative shape, in a negative sentiment. So it's mm -hmm. quite rare to have some kind of uh, positive uh, disinformation. It still happens, but it's much, much uh, less often. Uh, and the third is uh, the circumstances, uh, when that is published, uh, what kind of event is connected to that. 
Uh, so when you think of, of these three steps on any content piece level or uh, news website uh, level, this can help you to understand what's actually happening there and why. Uh, this is used by our analysts and our community of volunteers who, who support us with their own work. And that works really, really well. Uh, we made a lot of iterations with different processes, and this is one of the really, really that works well. Uh, here is another suggestion of uh, uh, Global Engagement Center. And this is a suggestion how to uh, just differentiate between uh, different sources. And that also helps a lot because if you know it's a government funded website like Kremlin funded websites or China funded websites, uh, there is a uh, uh, quite big chance that you need to be uh, more vigilant and check uh, what's happening there and uh, analyze it better. And then uh, when we analyze this, we publish reports of what's happening there, how much disinformation were in, in different countries, uh, what were happening on different peaks of disinformation, uh, what kind of narratives and soft narratives were the most popular ones uh, during that period and time. Uh, then also it's important to give some examples. So here's an, another, just an example from Estonia. So Estonian government increased uh, spending on defense and the Kremlin media picked it up as increase in offense and started to spread these uh, disinformation articles, which were even 34 articles with this case. And it's a clear uh, technique of disinformation forgery and hyperbolization in this case used. And we analyze and find many of these cases uh, from 600 to one and a half thousand uh, disinformation cases are found in Baltic states each month. So that's quite a lot of disinformation. So just to conclude here, uh, what I would say is that uh, with uh, when you want to under understand this three-step process, who, how, and when helps a lot. Uh, then there are all kinds of community events like this one that you are participating in. This also helps a lot. You learn new things, you meet other people who can, uh, when, then you can ask them, then you can discuss and understand better what's happening. Critical thinking is one of the skills that in these days is very important. We all need to think more critically, not to get paranoid, but we really need to think more critically and to understand what is happening there. Uh, one more good example is uh, Get Bad News Game uh, that we done in cooperation with a draw company from Netherlands. And uh, the game was tested and de uh, developed together with Cambridge University. And that game teaches citizens for six disinformation techniques. And we adopted the game, localized it in Baltic countries. And this game is a quite a big success because it increases uh, in 15 minutes, it increases the resilience to disinformation by about uh, uh, 20% by the uh, research of Cambridge. So that's quite a big result. And currently we already have 100,000 people who have played the game in Baltic countries more than 140,000 times. So that's another uh, example how we can understand better what is happening there and how to do that at very large scale. Yes, I think that gamification of this information spotting and also other things, you know, like, I guess this is probably the, the best way out there to, to increase this, this awareness, especially among the youth, because it's honestly, it's great fun. And it's not only what you just mentioned, uh, the EU versus Disinfo, also uh, offers tests how to spot uh, Russian disinformation out, uh, in, in the, the cyberspace. And uh, if, if we've got some gamers out there, you can also find the related games on Steam who uh, will help you uh, to tell apart certain elements. This is, this is simply amazing. And I must admit that I really do like the model that you just presented a lot because it, it comprises a, a few things that are excellent. First of all, you've got engagement of the uh, civil society. This is indispensable. And you have employed the AI to, to help you in your work and uh, every practitioner knows how, how much information do you sometimes have to deal with when you would like to just do simple media monitoring. It's, it's really, really a lot. And, um, also, what, what, I, what I like is that uh, there is a, a cross-country and uh, 
uh, cross country analysis and this is really cross border it's it's uh, it's simply amazing to see how it changes from country to country uh, i would like to pin uh, on one thing because we we still would like to to get some more uh, information from the credibility which is a cornerstone here and uh, to, to this to this credibility i would like to know a little bit more about this i see it as a kind of ideal, like, like the truth uh, website is credible. And I wonder if we can measure it and if we try to measure the, this credibility and how. With this question, I would like to uh, ask Professor uh, Wierzbicki to, to um, elaborate a little bit on this, uh, the, the credibility uh, of the source and, uh, and uh, to, to tell us how to, how to measure the, the discredibility of, of information in cyberspace. Uh, all right, thank you very much. I wanted first to get back at uh, what Victoria said, which uh, was very interesting because I started talking about norms of credibility evaluation. And this is exactly what you do. You try to teach those norms uh, using these games. Uh, this is uh, probably the best way to actually approach the problem of disinformation today and to deal with post information. It's really interesting. Also, uh, the process that you uh, showed in, with the involvement of AI is something which we have also been doing in our research. So, uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, our uh, older and current research uh, regarding measuring credibility. Well, first of all, uh, the kind of interesting part is that uh, since we are all the time involved in credibility evaluation, uh, and since credibility is a signal, it is something that can be measured just, just by asking uh, people. For example, using a Likert scale. Uh, like for example, in, in, in this, in this uh, graph, what we're showing is a Likert scale of credibility evaluations from not totally not credible to totally credible and uh, we are showing a distribution, a distribution of the, these evaluations from a sample of, of web users, which we have been doing. And uh, uh, this particular graph shows that uh, these three different colors uh, are for uh, less experienced and more experienced uh, internet users in terms of their just overall experience of using technology. Internet technology shows that uh, the more uh, experienced users are slightly more critical, slightly less likely to give the very high credibility evaluations. The effect is much stronger when we consider topical expertise, for example. So when we have uh, people who are experts on a certain topic, they tend to have much more balanced uh, credibility evaluations uh, when compared to non-experts uh, on, on this topic, right? On the other hand, you can, definitely tell something from these distributions. Uh, many, many times when you look at the general distributions, they are skewed towards the positive evaluations. What you see here is uh, a subset of the evaluations for a type of web pages about high yield investment programs. Uh, and uh, as you know, this is a type of fraud on the internet is quite popular, uh, unfortunately. And it shows you from this distribution, you can tell that this is not a very credible type of web pages, although a significant minority of people still believe that it is quite credible. Uh, the other question you might ask is, uh, okay, well, we can measure that, but are these ratings subjective? Are they maybe random? Are they robust to uh, different uh, just receiver characteristics? And uh, it turns out from our research that, uh, generally speaking, uh, the subjectivity of these ratings due to demographic uh, and social characteristics is not very, not very high. Uh, it can be pretty uh, sure that if you gather even a, a small sample of these ratings, like 10 perhaps, it should be enough in practice to give a good idea on the credibility. It depends, of course, on how you uh, uh, gather the ratings. But what we have been doing is we have been drawing a large sample of ratings first. Uh, which created a reference distribution. And then we generated smaller samples, for example, of size 10 as well. We could generate these samples completely randomly, or we could just, for example, take evaluations from women or just take evaluations from less or more educated people, uh, choosing the ratings at not random, but uh, with the particular uh, characteristic of the receivers fixed, okay? And what we did is we kind of measured what's the difference from these uh, distributions obtained from the smaller samples, either random or the uh, fixed uh, characteristics. 
uh, to the reference distribution. Okay, this can be actually measured using a specialized uh, function called an earth movement distance, which computes differences between distributions. Never mind about this. What you see on this table is uh, here you have the reference distributions, which are re the reference values, which are the differences of the small samples, which are random to the big distribution from all the, all the ratings, okay? And as long as these values in this part of the table don't exceed these values, it means that uh, the ratings we have in these data sets are resilient to age, gender, education, internet experience, politics, income, or occupation. Actually, uh, as you can see, only one value exceeds uh, the reference ratings. And this value was not obtained from, uh, this is actually a data set of movie lens opinions about movies, not about credibility ratings. These two data sets is what we created using our research, uh, which contained credibility valuations. So you can say credibility valuations are quite robust to demographic characteristics, okay? And the questions you have been asking a lot is about uh, sources, how we can evaluate sources. Well, uh, we have been studying uh, the domain of medical web content, which is different from what Victorious is doing, but we have used the same process, almost the same process of uh, creating a large, large set of uh, web content and then kind of splitting it up into topics and trying to prioritize which topics are most likely to contain uh, non-credible content. And uh, what we have found uh, is something which brings us back to the source evaluation. Uh, because uh, there is one uh, way of trying to evaluate sources in the medical domains, which is using uh, information from an international NGO uh, called Health on the Net. Uh, this NGO is uh, devoted to uh, providing uh, web portals and medical topics with certificates. You can get this kind of a certificate that you follow the Hong Code, you have been evaluated by independent evaluators. And our finding, uh, most recent finding, is that we have taken uh, a lot of statements from different web pages on medical topics. And those websites that had harm certificates had much, much fewer non credible statements than all the others. So it turns out that this kind of a certification actually works in practice in the medical domain. Uh, you can also take a look at the criteria that Hong is using. Uh, with respect to the evaluation of the sources, which is also something which uh, uh, leads us towards those norms of uh, uh, credibility evaluation, how, sh how we should evaluate sources of information. And this is also something which Victoria has been talking about because, for example, financial disclosure and transparency are a big part of, of, of this uh, approach as well. So just to summarize, uh, what I've been saying is that uh, you can measure credibility uh, in different ways, probably. Uh, you can uh, uh, reason about uh, credibility also using mathematical models. I haven't been talking about this here, uh, but uh, for example, this reasoning has led us to uh, the conclusion that we have to advertise truth. Uh, this is a kind of a very surprising thing uh, that came out of completely uh, uh, simulations and mathematical considerations of uh, the concept of credibility, uh, which basically means that if we have a community which has a low level of knowledge, or it is a post-truth community which has a wrong credibility evaluation on a certain topic, then one way of, perhaps the only way, of actually getting through to this community and changing their uh, opinion is to advertise truth. Uh, to make truth sound more attractive, uh, to do basically the same things which um, authors of fake news do uh, for their own messages, but do it for, for the truth. Uh, it's a little bit of a surprising conclusion, but uh, well, uh, it just shows you that uh, uh, this is an area full of surprises, I think. Um, on the other hand, one more thing that you can take into account when you think about credibility measurement online is that uh, this uh, level of expertise and some other factors, knowledge and also social environment, they can strongly influence credibility ratings. Not demographic characteristics, but definitely uh, your social environment. That's the part which is the, what I've been talking about post-truth. Small minorities of people which have the same credibility evaluation, uh, they will tend to uh, sure. still believe. Uh, uh, and they will, exercise peer pressure or they will exercise uh, 
uh, a certain attitude towards all the others which are not part of the group, which will also lead to the bias in credibility evaluations. Um, to advertise the truth, this is this is a yes. very strong message. I, I, I do like it, and I think this is a, a great outcome of, of this utterance and a kind of a conclusive point that I will I will keep in my memory after this session. Uh, so we, we think of um, disinformation as a threat in multiple different domains. Uh, from the policy level, we sometimes can perceive it as a kind of political threat and include it maybe in the political risk analysis or, or just see it as a political risk uh, that can be, uh, be seen from the high level and of, of uh, public services and, and, and so on. That's uh, really interesting that we can add this thing, but also to, to add it to evaluations and, and to basically basically measure it in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a certain way, include it in models. And uh, from this thing, I, I would like to move to a little bit different point because this is what I get that um, academia or and experts and, and policymakers can, can, can think of. But I would like to, to move also to an average netizen. What can that person do to avoid being a bubble, uh, to avoid being manipulated, and how to structure and how to organize the, the information environment that person has to be informed, to rely on, on good and uh, authentic sources and to find uh, himself in this environment in which there is an increasing noise and a lot of information uh, that some of it is it's not really really authentic or, or legitimate. And with this question, I would like to, to move to Victoras. Victoras, if you could tell us how to organize and how to structure your um, your information uh, ecosystem to, to feel good in it. Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, so first, um, uh, I think uh, the integration of um, uh, science and, and practical work, uh, it's in most cases, that's the answer for long-term solutions. And uh, what Professor Adam is working on and uh, these studies, these are extremely important uh, to learn, because then you see the patterns, what kind of patterns are found, and then you can implement the solutions. And uh, that is a very big deal. I mean, that uh, it's like having a map in the forest and knowing where to go, instead of when you're doing something and you don't know, you just walk around in the forest. So these type of researchers, as Professor Adam presented, are very important for this field, understand better, and how to move over that forest. So when we ask about uh, how, how to build this safer environment, how, how to not uh, keep ourselves in bubbles, uh, it also requires, you know, I would say even you can compare it with a food diet. You know, now we live such a phased life. Uh, we need to run everywhere, everywhere. Okay, now we are a bit closed in our homes, working remotely, not uh, going too much outside. And, uh, you know, in order to be healthy, we need to stop and think what we are eating, uh, what, I, what I kind of food we are taking, you know, are we going to outside or do some sports in-house? So in order to feel healthy, we need to do that. Uh, our bodies require that, they require it for, you know, millions of years. So the th same thing is with information, you know, guys, if we uh, don't think what we consume, uh, we end up uh, with just some kind of very popular uh, social media uh, links. And, uh, you know, you can compare them with the cheap calories. Uh, you consume it, you just spend, you know, two hours on TikTok. Uh, the question is, what have you learned? And uh, was it just fun? Or was there some kind of, um, uh, maybe you were very relaxed and you were just consuming information. And uh, you never gave even a thought of was that information credible or should it be something that you could quote to your friends or you know with, with your friend in a bar or with your family and uh, uh, if you're not thinking about that you might end up in a very very weird situations when in some kind of public space you know in, even in family space 
someone is saying things that are uh, clearly uh, not true and even just by putting some thoughts on that and uh, if the person is so convinced and he's so bubbled in that it's very very hard to convince the person differently you know people tend to believe what they believe and belief systems are uh, kind of a core of our thinking and our mind and there are many researchers that show that so i think that's very important so be careful with what you consume you know if you scroll uh, social media sites uh, if it's cats and dogs it's fine but you know if if you're starting to uh, to read something that is more uh, that is very emotional that is uh, that's, that has some kind of uh, uh, it's something about uh, NATO, military, politics, uh, energy. Uh, there m- might be a lot of things that will be forgeries, fakes, and uh, just attempts to play with your emotions. So maybe next time when you go to vote, you would vote how someone established the narrative so to achieve the goal in the large scale population. Uh, so that's an important uh, thing. In order not to become ships, we need to think. And uh, this thinking, uh, and thinking like about diet, uh, that helps a lot. It's a good metaphor to understand. And we need to, to think critically. Uh, we just need sometimes to you know, stop and actually think. Because when we run and run and run over lives, run from work back to home, uh, to our children, to our family, friends, and, and you know, life happens. There's so many things. And uh, we need to stop a bit, think uh, what kind of media we're consuming, what benefits it uh, gives to us, and is it actually uh, something that you can later quote and not look as a fool? So uh, that's a serious consequence. And uh, it's important to think about that. When we speak, speak about bubbles, uh, this is another problem. Uh, it's also connected a lot with our beliefs. If we believe it's something, we tend to uh, find many more arguments why that is true. And um, uh, a very good um, uh, like a measurement point is that if you're reading and analyzing and learning something new, is, that, um, uh, is it very comfortable for you? Is it uh, fully aligned with your values, with what you think? And uh, it doesn't uh, put any uh, thoughts that, is this really right or wrong? Is this uh, not very comfortable for me to hear? So every time we move to this less comfortable space, it's a learning process. We learn something new. And uh, that's a good way to get out of these bubbles. Also, events like these. Researchers like uh, Professor Adams and uh, others. So just putting a bit more effort on that. There's a lot of really good YouTube channels. Uh, It's a bit more difficult space, I would say, because you you might end up with algorithms uh, showing you a lot of conspiracy theories. So (laughs) there is a high risk of of, uh, getting there. And uh, uh, that is another problem. But, uh, you know, if we just take step by step, when you think and read about the article, so just put a little thought in that. Who is publishing the article, why they are doing that, and what kind of goals they have. That will help uh, to understand what is happening or just do the first baby steps. But it's already a huge thing. You know, When you start to think, it's the first thing that leads to change. So you're saying it's also worthy to stay vigilant uh, for every individual that is checking uh, the news sources and, and, and other pieces of information he encounters. You know, you need to be uh, careful with a vigilant word, uh, not to get paranoid, <laughs> because that, that's not, not the thing that uh, you need to achieve. But, uh, you know, when you read something more critical or lightweight, you just, uh, you know, you consume information. And... Uh, Consumption of different types of information in a way defines you. Uh, so mm-hmm. defines what you know, it defines what you think. So you need to expand your horizons and you need to just double check if you are uh, reading uh, really correct facts, 
You know, even mm -hmm. even in some history books, some facts later over 10 or 15 years or 20 years changes and you need to like, oh, double check. Yeah. yeah. So I would say that if it's something uh, that it gives you like a thought, oh, man, this is is this really true? Uh, can it be true? Uh, just type it in Google and look if someone uh, else already had this question. And the funny thing is that Google algorithms uh, do a really good work in typing uh, autocomplete for questions. And in most cases, you will find that somebody already typed that question and you might find some relevant results. And uh, gentlemen, Obviously. I see that we do have a few questions and uh, left. So uh, I would like to uh, give the floor to, to Professor Adam. To, to, to comment on what, what you just, just said. I will only mention that I used the word vigilant because it has a prominent career recently in everything that relates to disinformation, just like resilience. But this is a career unparalleled, of course, to fake news, which was the, the buzz, buzzword of a year. And uh, Professor Adam, if you could comment. Uh, well, uh, I really like the word vigilance as well. Uh, I'm a fan of Harry Potter and there is a character there called Mad-Eyed Moody, who has this kind of uh, uh, term, constant vigilance, it's what he's uh, done to his. And this is something which is uh, useful, very useful in the uh, internet as well. Uh, of course, you can reach the level of paranoia, as it, this example uh, shows, but uh, still, uh, you have to be vigilant. I agree with that. Uh, also, I very much like Victoria's analogy to a diet, because it shows you that uh, uh, the consumption of information might actually affect uh, your beliefs and your uh, mental makeup, your kind of a horizon. Actually, I like this kind of an analogy as well of a horizon of the internet or horizon of the web, of the things which you can reach very quickly, things which are the first in your mind. When you search for something, what expectations do you have? This kind of defines this kind of a horizon. And where do you go? Do you just go to social media? or and to spend all of your time there. This is actually, this has been shown as a big factor in uh, the existence of conspiracy theories and in the effect that they can have on entire populations or, or societies. In societies where people spend the majority of their time on social media, it can lead to disaster, uh, basically. Uh, but I would like to stress yet another point uh, which is a little bit uh, strange from my mouth, uh, but uh, still I, I want to do this because I've been researching uh, medical web content recently. And this brings to a very important question is, whom can you trust on the internet? And also, uh, should we trust experts? Uh, this is something which we haven't been asking yet and we haven't been talking about this. Uh, and it is really important in the medical domain because there, uh, the content can only be evaluated if you have sufficient knowledge or expertise. On the other hand, Google gives us the illusion of reaching this information very quickly. You might think it is at your fingertips. You just have to type in the search terms and you get a lot of actually medical articles. You can access to PubMed, you can access to lots of different places. You can access, of course, websites which give this information to you in much more friendly terms, or you can access social media where people discuss these things and uh, give ready opinions, ready-made opinions, which you can actually consume, like Victoria said, right? And uh, uh, there is this very famous uh, relationship of the amount of expertise and the amount of confidence, right? If you have just a little bit of information, your confidence tends to rise tremendously. If you actually get a lot of information, become an expert, the first you, your confidence drops and then it rises, but not as much as, as you actually have when you just have very little information, right? Uh, so my advice, at least in the terms of the medical uh, domain, do trust the experts, even though it is not, this is not the only way you have to do. You have to use your own common sense experience as well. Uh, experts don't know everything. Experts can't always be trusted. Remember that the controversy on the vaccines and autism started with a medical expert who published his research in Lancet, the main medical uh, uh, journal. Uh, still, this has been verified, although it took a very long time, but it has been verified. And it, that's also the difference between an expert and a non-expert, is that experts must undergo verification, okay? When we publish research articles, it, they are reviewed, right? It's about the same. The difference is also very important in the media, right? In mainstream media, uh, there is, in principle, someone who should review the information on social media. There is no one. 
Uh, so that's what the big difference as well, coming back to what Victor was saying. Professor, we are shortly running uh, out of time, and I guess this is the right moment to move to the questions from the audience. We do sure. have quite a few of those. I don't know if you're going to, to be able to answer all of them, but if not, we will try to, to get back to the people who ask the questions afterwards and provide um, the answers in, in writing. Uh, I will um, address those questions right now in the, in the order they were posed. And as some of them were not uh, really conclusive in to do with which person are they asked, I will just duly, duly distribute them. Uh, the first question is uh, clearly to, to Victoras. Uh, is the debunk EU open source and is it easily adaptable to other languages than Polish and Lithuanian? Yes, uh, debunk uh, technology is built on open, so open source technologies generally to analyze uh, public information. It can be easily adopted to any language. Uh, currently, we have 26 languages that we are operating in. And the uh, second question is um, to, to the professor. What is the actual difference between misinformation and disinformation? Uh, could you explain more for roughly? You have addressed those things and also malinformation. So if I can add my input, if you could include malinformation in your answer, I'll be driven. I'll try, <laughs> I'll try. Also the, the difference between misinformation and disinformation is kind of easy to explain. Uh, it depends on the intent of the uh, source, right? So if the source uh, uh, wants to uh, manipulate you to give you some information which is uh, the source evaluates is not credible and it wants to make you believe it's credible. That's disinformation. On the other hand, if the source just makes an honest mistake, uh, and that would be misinformation, okay? An honest mistake would be misinformation. So I believe that this information is credible, but I made a mistake. I tried to convince you it is credible. Maybe together we actually find out it's not credible. And I say, okay, sorry, I was wrong. This is misinformation. That's the type of misinformation. When malinformation is a little bit more complex than that, because uh, uh, it starts with the um, with a core of truth. Okay, uh, there is something. For example, let me go back to this example with immigrants. Okay, so unfortunately, let's imagine the scenario that some immigrant committed a crime. Okay. Now, this could be just a factual statement, right? This happens, the police reported it. That's it, right? What I make with this statement makes it more information, okay? I can say now, as usual, immigrants commit crimes which threaten our society. And I give this example, okay? That is more information because I'm actually uh, changing the meaning a little bit. Uh, I am actually generalizing it for example, or I'm making it more threatening. I'm saying this will destroy our society. Immigrants will destroy our society. Here is the evidence. And uh, this is uh, changing the meaning. So actually the message, in my opinion, at least, the message of malinformation no longer is true. Uh, it is a manipulative message which has a core of truth, okay? Very often conspiracy theories are created in such a way. Uh, for example, uh, conspiracy theories tend to add a little bit of more information to something which is true. Like we have the fact that COVID started Just in Wuhan. Clarify. Sometimes okay. you, can, you can find in definitions of malinformation that it has the intention or intent to harm. But mm -hmm. thank you, and also based on my, my, my own uh, views, I think it should be rather the, the intent to manipulate than harm. Rather. Exactly. Exactly, the intent to manipulate by changing your credibility evaluation, right? Uh, you can go back a little bit from harm to a step back just to change your credibility evaluation. If I'm trying to influence your credibility evaluation, that's manipulation, uh, especially if I'm doing this starting uh, from uh, a very questionable premise, like for example, a generalization or catastrophe, some kind of cognitive distortion, right? For example, right? Like, uh, so, uh, yes, so my, my information, I would say, is a type of uh, manipulation as well, right? And another question goes to Victoras. You have mentioned critical thinking earlier on as, as one of the, uh, let's say, research tools that should be available to everyone. Uh, 
And uh, the question goes, how do you define critical thinking? I, I'm not sure what the, the, the person who asked the question meant actually comes to the person who has to employ this critical thinking. But let's, let's base your answer on two types of, of people. First of all, of an average netizen that doesn't have a, a high expertise in, in evaluations. And second, on the expert, what does the critical mean, uh, thinking mean for both? So I would define it in a very simple way. I would say that uh, if you are only running and running and running and never giving even a thought of what's happening around you, uh, then it's a clear evidence that there's not too much critical thinking or maybe thinking at all. Uh, it's just consumption. It's like, you know, uh, sitting by your TV and eating everything uh, your hand can uh, get or what your eyes can see. Uh, that has consequences uh, similar with information. You know, uh, when you, I would say that for a citizen, uh, if you just spend time in social media, and many of us do, and uh, you know, when later we get this uh, iPhone or Android weekly report of where and how many hours were spent, we're quite surprised uh, how much time we spend on iPhone or you know Android and so on. And that's uh, become a big, big part of our lives. We pick up those phones so often, you know, hundred times over day. And um, uh, when you spend time there and you consume something, and then later if you quote it or share it, here is the important part that comes. Do you, are you sharing information that it's uh, scandalous? Uh, and uh, is it really real or it's fake? Uh, or it just connects with your beliefs and you're sharing it with, without verifying? So I would say that the first uh, thing for every citizen is to think before sharing, if this is really real. You know, uh, you can ask your friends, do they think it's real, you know, before sharing and then to share with it. It's a, you know, it's always good to ask some kind of question and to double check. I don't believe that it's possible for every person to be, become an expert. That is too difficult. That is too time consuming. You know, you need to spend, you know, all your working time on that. It's too complicated. But you can find people who know more and you can verify things with them. You can follow journalists, you can follow analysts. Uh, you can follow influencers who are really credible. And, you know, if you just double check for the feedback about those persons, about those experts, in most cases you find, just be aware that, uh, you know, if you are asking hammer, it will always find nails. So be careful if you're asking someone who is very uh, one side or other side leaning, that you will get responses that are very uh, connected with that. Uh, and, uh, you know, in, in a way, you could say that that um, uh, that person is not fully, I would say, balanced. Uh, and uh, you know, if you ask something that uh, some older, uh, you know, family member, they might have some um, values that are very very strict, and uh, uh, maybe they are not good for these times. Uh, so you need to think of that. So every time you receive information, you need to understand whom are you receiving it from. How it's, is it balanced? Is it not balanced? So these small things help a lot to think, you know. And for the experts, uh, this is quite, uh, <laughs> that's the place where I could speak for next uh, eight hours. So <laughs> that is a bit more complicated. Especially that there is another question to you uh, that is very much related. Uh, and as I can say, it's a bit hard and tricky. Uh, uh, Mr. Dakshas, isn't the case that there's always more money on the side of disinformers than the bankers? Moreover, analysis and debunking takes time, as you, as you have pointed out. And when the clock is ticking, damage is already done, people misled, sentiments polarized. Uh, you present your enterprise as, as easy, but I believe it, uh, it really is not, especially when the, the matter cannot be fully disclosed or checked, topics related to the military, trade secrets, someone's health status and so on. And that's a very inquisitive um, approach uh, in which I would like you to, to elaborate a little bit, just to say, how can you, first of all, stay on objective, but also how, how can you proceed when there is a clock ticking and there is a, a, a risk of damage being done 
or if the damage is is done and you need to mitigate it. This is, by the way, a cornerstone of resilience as, as we understand it from the systemic perspective. I, I love this question. Probably this is the one, one of the most popular questions I get in the uh, you know, last uh, three years. Um, uh, we really have been traveling a lot. Uh, uh, we spoke as organization in more than 100 events, uh, 18 countries. So this is a very, very often question, and uh, it, it has a very important reason behind. So, you know, with uh, how to put it uh, in a right, uh, first thing, uh, when we started like three years ago, we asked the question, uh, what is happening at the big picture if you look around the world? We found uh, more than 100 organizations around that time who were working to counter disinformation. We interviewed them, we analyzed, and we saw a thing that most of them uh, were analyzing and working and doing things and uh, quite manually. And uh, here we define it as a little bit joke. We call it 2G method, which is Google and gut feeling. That's how the analysis is done. Only some organ organizations were able to have some automation to be, to be able to uh, analyze and respond much more rapidly. Uh, the other thing that we discovered is that on one side, we have disinformation actors. On the other side, we have debunkers. And uh, uh, we think that the main thing that is the game changer around the world is what are the costs to create this information and to debunk it. Currently, the main problem is that to create this information, it is much cheaper and faster and lies spread faster than truth. That's another problem, conceptual. And the other side, debunking is pretty slow, resource intensive. It's quite fragmented. There's quite many organizations doing that, but they're really small, underfunded. Uh, not all of them have processes and automation to be able to do that uh, really, really well. You require methodology to do that really well, because if you don't, that means you don't have processes and that means you will slow or you will risk with your credibility. So the general question where I would put everything is that, what do we do all together to change the costs to create this information and to debunk it? We need to change the balance. And when the, to create this information will become much more expensive than to debunk it, then all around the world things change. So that's um, uh, the bigger perspective, how to look at it. And then the other part of debunking. So we spend a lot of time uh, in perfecting processes, perfecting methodology, doing these iterations, implementing, testing for two or four weeks, looking if that worked or not, then trying a new thing, a new thing, and that's how we're learning. We need to learn to improve those processes to be able to report faster. When did we do the analysis? So just a final thought, analysis is like a diagnosis. It shows what is happening there, but this is, this is the first step to understand and later to move forward and make decisions with that. We have one, la one uh, last question, uh, also to you, Victoras. So can we conclude that tolerance of discomfort is a necessary quality for dissolving bubbles and lifelong learning? Can we say that this is a meta skill of information literacy? Very good. It's a very good question. And you know, uh, in uh, 10 or 20 years, uh, like, 20 or more percent of the jobs that are now will disappear. The question is what we will do uh, other that robots cannot do. And to be creative, to think critically, this is something that uh, robots still or AI still will not be able to do for a long time. And uh, you know, uh, if learning is not painful, probably you're learning something that you already know. Uh, so that would be the final thought. Exactly. With that, I would like to, to, to thank you both for this amazing discussion and all your inputs. And I guess there are three, uh, three thoughts that I will remember after this session. And I would like to, to become a kind of conclusion of, of what we have discussed. Uh, first of all, that we should advertise the truth Second of all, that we should avoid fast foods is also with regard to, to the information uh, environment we are creating ourselves and, and for us, of course. And third one, which is sometimes overlooked when you do see uh, disinformation and malign actors everywhere, that it's also not good for you. So uh, but as, you, as you said on the margin, but it's still very important that we 
have to uh, resist getting a bit paranoid about what is happening all around us and just check the sources if we can. And with that, I would like to, to thank you all. Thank, thank you, uh, my distinguished guests here, and also thank to the audience. And I think that we should move to another session. Yes, thank, thank you. you very much. And yes, we are moving to, to, to the next session.